Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 2. I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble. For a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every delight, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. If no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind, or authority over the day of death, and there is no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. All this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. April 30th, 1789, on the balcony of Federal Hall in New York City, Robert Livingston, Chancellor of the State of New York, administered Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, to George Washington, who upon repeating it became the first American president. The oath of office, the presidential oath, you've probably heard it. It's been repeated by all 44 presidents over 22 decades. And with left hand laid on the Bible, let's just do it. I'm never going to get a chance to do this, so (laughs) why not here? I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, whether any sitting president effectively keeps that oath of office will leave to history to decide. But there's another oath we need to talk about today. You may never take that oath of office for President of the United States, but there's another oath that is equally important. You could call it the citizen's oath to king and country. The oath that we take as Americans, and I'm preaching this obviously in America to Americans. If we were in Europe, if we were in England, I'd say the oath we take as the British. Wherever you are, we have an oath that we have taken. Not a presidential oath, but verse 2, I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. And that's not the king's oath before God. It's yours. It's mine. A personal oath, not a presidential one, to keep the command of the king. Literally in the Hebrew, to attend to the mouth of the king. So more than commands, it's being attentive to whatever the king or ruler says. It's listening up. It's more than commands and laws. What we're talking about here is commitment and loyalty. Give heed, if you will. Pay attention. Listen up. Attend to the mouth of the king. There is an implied responsibility of God's people to accept whatever governing authority is over them and to accept that authority as from God. Keep your finger here and turn over to Romans 13. Romans 13, one of, more, one of the more difficult sections of Scripture, depending on where you live and, and at what time you live. Romans 13, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a good minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. (laughs) 
For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. And then he sums it up with this. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Now perhaps you've read this or or heard it. And in our political climate, if it's just about respecting the office of the president, well, that would be one thing. But there's a far greater issue at hand than accepting a certain party's majority in our government. Paul was not writing to 21st century Americans saying, look, if the Democrats are in, you need to respect that. Or if the Republicans are in... You just need to respect that. That is a very watered down and simplistic way of looking at what Paul's saying. It is far deeper than that. We are to keep the command of the king. I want to repeat that. Make sure we get it clearly. We are to keep the command of the king, the ruler, the authority. We are in subjection. We must keep his command. What if the king is a Qaddafi? Spelled with a G or a Q or a K, I don't care. What if the ruler is an Assad or a Hussein or an Ahmadinejad or, in Paul and the Romans' case, a Nero? How do I take these words then? And how do I live by this command? What if the governing authority, be it a monarchy, or a dictatorship, or a republic, or whatever, what if it becomes oppressive? At what point do we have the right to throw off the reins of oppression? We live in a country, my friends, that began as a result of a people throwing off the reins of oppression. And you can struggle with this one, reading Romans 13, verses 1 through 8, and comparing it to American history 220 or so years ago, Did they follow Romans 13? (laughs) Rick, you're on the line here. We threw off the yoke of oppression as Americans. Our Declaration of Independence, which begins when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. This country wouldn't exist if we had not thrown off the oppression of England at the time. That's right. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have. So don't get me wrong. I actually believe that our independence, hard fought, was right in the sight of God. But that's another discussion for another time. But here's the thing. To take the oath of servitude before God to any governing authority is, according to Scripture, a very serious thing. As believers in Jesus Christ, we first and foremost among all people in America need to seriously consider what it means to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Or as Koheleth is saying in Ecclesiastes, subjection to the king, to those who rule, to those who are in charge. Verse 3. He says, do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? Now, I want to take you back a little bit in history and consider a couple of individuals and how they responded to the authority, to the yoke of oppression that was on them. One was a king by the name of Zedekiah. Zedekiah, the last king of Israel, took an oath to another king to be in subjection to him. That other king was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Zedekiah took an oath to be under Nebuchadnezzar, and he broke that oath. Listen to this, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke for the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by his God, which is exactly what Kohala says. 
He violates this word. Keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. And Zedekiah made an oath before God to follow and to serve Nebuchadnezzar. And he broke that oath. The Bible says he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Rather than putting Israel's oppressive situation in God's hands, Zedekiah took matters into his own hands. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 17, you can turn there quickly or or just listen. Ezekiel gives a further explanation of what happened here. Ezekiel 17, verse 11 Ezekiel prophesying says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Do you not know what these things mean? Say, Behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, took its king and princes, and brought to him, brought them to him in Babylon. He took one of the royal family and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath. He also took away the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be in subjection, not exalting itself, but keeping his covenant that it might continue. But he, that is Zedekiah, rebelled against him, that is Nebuchadnezzar, by sending his envoys down to Egypt that they might give him horses and many troops. Will he succeed? Will he who does such things escape? Can he indeed break the covenant and escape? As I live, declares the Lord, surely in the country of the king who put him on the throne, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he broke in Babylon, he shall die. Have you ever thought about this before? That God punishes Zedekiah, king of Jerusalem, king of Judah, because Zedekiah, king of Judah, broke his oath to Nebuchadnezzar, the oppressive king of Babylon. That's what Ezekiel says happened there. God had a plan. God had things in motion. Yes, Babylon had taken over. Yes, the people of Judah were taken into captivity. And Zedekiah was set up there as king in Jerusalem under the rule and reign of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. But Zedekiah didn't accept that. The reality is, my friends, that was God's plan, God's will, God's timing. And Zedekiah said, no. And he threw off or tried to throw off that yoke of oppression. And so the outcome was bad. Nebuchadnezzar had Zedekiah's sons executed before his very eyes. And then immediately had Zedekiah's eyes put out. So the last thing, parents listen, the last thing he would see on earth was the death of his boys. I've always assumed the boys were grown men. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he came into rule in Jerusalem. He was 11 years later, his sons were killed and he was blinded. He was 32. How old could his sons have been? Pretty young. 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, murdered. And that was the last thing Zedekiah would see. And ultimately, Zedekiah died in Babylon because he broke the oath he had taken before God to serve the oppressive Nebuchadnezzar. You know, someone else died in Babylon. A man by the name of Daniel. Daniel, who took a very different approach than Zedekiah took. Daniel's eyes weren't put out. He became a seer, a prophet for the Lord, and saw great things. Daniel didn't die in misery. He died in peace after seeing that Israel would return to their land according to the prophet Jeremiah. He realized the time was almost up. And Daniel saw what Zedekiah would never see. That Israel's time in Babylon, listen, their time in Babylon was by divine design. Or you could say by prophetic procedure. Look at verse 5 in Ecclesiastes 8. He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. Mm. For there is a proper time and procedure for every delight, though, listen, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. You think it was easy for Daniel, having lived probably his first 17 or so years in Jerusalem, in Judah, being taken into captivity, having his world stripped away from him, and having to live the rest of his life in Babylon, and indeed he would die there. Would that be easy for him? Or would that be difficult? 
Of course it would be difficult. Of course his trouble would be heavy upon him. But even for all that, Daniel did not choose the root of Zedekiah. He did not rebel. He did not jump up against the oppressive rule of Nebuchadnezzar. Instead, he recognized God was at work. He realized the Lord was doing something. That Hebrew word for procedure in verses 5 and 6 is mishpat. We've seen it before. It means judgment or discretion. Listen to what Daniel saw. Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. In the first year of his reign, that is the reign of Darius, I, Daniel, observed in the book the number of the years which was the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem. 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications, with fasting, with sackcloth, and with ashes. Listen, Zedekiah and Daniel were the, in the exact same situation. But the two men took two completely different roads. Zedekiah took the humanistic way. Zedekiah said, I will throw off this oppression. He appealed to Egypt. Bible students, what is Egypt a picture of in the word? The world. Zedekiah appeals to the world. He goes down to Egypt and says, send troops, help me. I'm going to try and overthrow Babylon. It was the wrong move. He trusted the world. Daniel, on the other hand, instead of going the humanistic route, went the heavenly route. Trusting the Lord, Daniel went down on his knees in prayer. Two completely different approaches. As followers of Jesus Christ, Daniel's way is the way that we are called to walk. Not Zedekiah's. We are not called to be overthrowers. We are called to be prayerful warriors. We read this verse on Wednesday night, and I think this passage probably could sum up the entire book of, of Ecclesiastes. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Heavenly things, not humanistic things. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Isn't that what we've been talking about in this book? There's a humanistic way you can go. There is a worldly path you can walk and you can take and it trusts in the power of man and it goes after man's understanding and it seeks to elevate man and it never works. That's right. Or you can take the heavenly route. You can set your mind on things above. You can focus on Jesus Christ. You can be a man, a woman of prayer and it works. Amen. Even though life be oppressive, difficult, hard, though a man or a woman's trouble be upon them, You have a choice. Trust the world. Trust the Lord. This whole sermon that the preacher is giving, Kohaleth, has one primary purpose, and that is to prove from a human perspective that nothing can be known under the sun. And to show we need a higher perspective. Rather than be under the sun, we need to get above the sun. We need to set ourselves, our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 7, he says, if no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? Okay, what's he saying? He's saying, you don't have a clue what's coming down the pike. You don't know what will come tomorrow, the next day, or the day after that. And so, truly, mankind does need governing. We need government. We've got to have some kind of authority. Because we never know what's coming. We have no control over the bigger realities of life. The harsher things that could happen. Wearing government does have a place, does have a rule, is important. And Kohaleth in the next verse gives four examples of why we need government. (laughs) Of our lack of control and the need for us to have some sort of governance. Verse 8, he says, No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind, or authority over the day of death. And there is no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. So, four things in one verse. Number one, the power of the wind. We have no control over the power of the wind. No man has authority to restrain the wind, he says, with the wind. And we have some great examples of this very recently, but let's go back to 2005 when a tiny little zephyr named Katrina helped America realize once again we have no power over the wind. You know, we saw it coming. We knew it was in the Gulf. We saw it 
speeding up. We saw it getting bigger, this monstrous storm out there. We were aware of its advance, but there was no authority to stop it. Jesus wasn't on a boat in the Gulf that day. (laughs) Or it would have been over. Calm. Lord, there's a hurricane coming. Hush. No control. But you know, even with advance warning, no one imagined the devastation that would come in its wake. Let me tell you something that I think was more frightening than the actual physical devastation wrought by Katrina. It was what happened among human beings after the devastation. I remember just watching the news saying, it's like the Wild West. Lawlessness exploded in New Orleans and along the Gulf Coast. People doing whatever they wanted to do, taking things out of stores, and people walking up and down the streets bearing firearms just to protect themselves. It was frightening. People standing on rooftops with nowhere to go. And this looting and violence and, and killing until order was restored, it was every man for himself. That scared me. Because in America 2005, I thought we were better than that. And we're reminded once again, where there is no governance, man goes wild. That's exactly what happened. Bible students, you know the Hebrew word for wind. Anytime you see wind, it's ruach in the Hebrew, and it's wind or spirit. There is no power under the sun that can restrain a person's spirit. You can read it that way. In fact, some Bible translations translate it that way. No man has authority to restrain the spirit with the spirit. Guess what? Your spirit cannot restrain my spirit. You can lock me up. You can try to silence me. But as long as I have breath, you cannot restrain my spirit. Any more than I can restrain yours. It's God alone who recognizes the power of... Of the human spirit. And the Lord recognizes the power he gave the human spirit. Back in Genesis 11, verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, building the Tower of Babel. He says, Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Can't restrain that spirit. The spirit of man is a powerful thing. Now, there is a restraining influence on the world right now. There is something holding back the tide of evil under the sun. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit, I believe, in the church and through the church. Boy, people say the church has its problems. I say, can you imagine the church without the Holy Spirit? (laughs) Holding back, stemming the tide of evil... But the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. I want you to imagine this world without the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit that we've had for the last 2,000 years. Imagine post-Katrina-like behavior as the norm for daily life in the world. That day's coming. When the spirit is removed. Well, when's the spirit going to be removed? When the church is removed. At that time, called the rapture, the harpazo, the catching up, the spirit will be removed along with the church. And the lawlessness of humanity after Katrina will pale by comparison. No one has authority to restrain the wind with the wind, the spirit with the spirit. We need some kind of governing. Secondly, no one has authority over the day of death, the power of death, power of the wind, the power of death. You can't stop it. And we've already seen this a couple of times in Ecclesiastes. Kohala says (laughs) it's one of the absolutes. You cannot stop death. Genesis 2.16, the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, of course, there are those who say, well, Adam didn't die that day. No, he set in motion his death that day. From that day forward, Adam started dying. That's right. Because he sinned. And we know, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Bad news. If you sin in your life, you're going to die. So, even if I only sin once, yeah, you already started it in motion. It is unstoppable. Unless, of course, Jesus calls us home before we die. Which you know I'm banking on. I I, I was given this. John sent this to me. I wanted to give him credit. 
This just cracked me up. I'm in the middle of studying, and this came across my email. A little article entitled, Till Death Do Us Part. Apart from taxes, the only certainty in life is death. Thankfully, your expiration need not end your involvement with the shooting sports thanks to Holy Smoke, a company offering a very interesting service. (laughs) For $1,250, far less than the cost of most funeral arrangements, Holy Smoke will will load cremated remains into ammunition. (laughs) <laughs> I thought you'd get a bang out of this <laughs> Sorry, I had to take a shot <laughs> Through a funeral provider One pound of the descendant's ashes Are shipped to Holy Smoke Then the company staff Will, with great care and reverence Load the ash <laughs> Into 250 rounds of shotgun Or pistol ammunition Or 100 rounds of rifle ammunition Your choice You can also opt to purchase a handcrafted wood ammo box to display the macabre loads for an additional $100. In case you're wondering, none of the ash will affect the bore or the rifling of your forearm as it's loaded into the bullet or shot cup. This will probably be a relief to whoever has to clean the gun after a farewell session at the range. (laughs) So if you're a diehard firearm enthusiast, literally, you can make your partation in shooting last beyond the grave. Wow. I mean, the, what we do to try and live just a little bit further, and I, I, I just, I have a feeling I know what John's going to do with his remains, but you know, it's your call, dude. The power of death. And Kohala says we can't, we can't control that day. We don't know when it's coming. We don't know it's how, how it's going to come or how it's going to happen. And so, and so we've got to have some kind of governance. And number three, the power of war. The power of war. For there is no discharge in the time of war. And those of you in the military understand this principle. You're not discharged when we're about to go to battle. Hey, you know, I've I've pretty much served my time wondering if I could get out early. Uh, No, here are your papers. (laughs) We'll see you on the front lines. There's no discharge. Some of you know this. In Israel... Everyone serves two years mandatory military service. You graduate high school, you go into the military two years. Everyone. And then, once you're out, you become a reservist for the rest of your life. You give up, what is it, a, 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 I think it's a month every year for maneuvers and training to, to stay sharp. All your life in Israel. Well, well, why is that? Well, here's a country who understands the constant threat of war. A people who have spent the last 60 plus years under threat from all around, and the threat's increasing, as you all know. Interesting. They live under the threat of war. James tells us in James 4.1, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? In other words, as long as man lives on the earth, there will be war. As long as there is man, there will be war, with the only exception, and that's the governance of Jesus. That will put an end to it. But until that day comes, if there's a person on earth, they'll be fighting with themselves. Interesting that James wrote that immediately after having written this. James 3.17, he says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, and gentle, and reasonable. But boy, reasonable. We could use some of that in our government. Full of mercy. And good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And then he goes on to say, what is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? It's your pleasures that wage war. And so what's interesting is James is making a great point. If we set our mind on things above, if we pursue wisdom that is from above, we are less likely to be warring in our behavior. Far more likely to be peaceful. And that works in your family as well as it does in our country. If we have our minds set on the wisdom that is from above, there is peace there. That's the only possibility of peace. But humanity, unfortunately, does not function with the wisdom from above. Humanity functions from the wisdom under the sun, below. So the power of the wind, the power of death, power of war, and number four, the power of sin. Power of sin. He says, evil will not deliver those who practice it. 
You know, I, I saw an interesting uh, rated R uh, explanation. You know how they give the, the R rating or the PG-13 rating, and then they kind of tell why in the little box? And I saw, I've never seen this before, maybe you have, it was rated R for violence, uh, sexual innu- innuendo, and pervasive language. Pervasive language. Why is that? Well, because when you've said every word in the book anyway, the only thing you can do is just say it a lot. <laughs> just keep saying it and say it some more. And make every line massively full of pervasive language. I... And I thought, this is what sin does. Sin is never satisfied. It never ends. It's never enough to say, hey, we have, we have the right to freedom to have bad language and rain in our movies. No, we've got to go to pervasive. I'm wondering what word they're going to come up with next. Constant? You know, rated R for constant language. You're nonstop. Rated R because there is no English, only curse words. (laughs) And when is it enough? And the answer is, evil will not deliver those who practice it. Evil never stops. Sin never stops. The power of sin is massive in this world. And it's an interesting way here of just saying that sin will hold you to your choices. Evil will not deliver you. Evil will not allow you to change your mind. And Paul says in Romans 5.12, Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Later he would go on to say, not in the likeness of Adam. Maybe you didn't sin the way Adam sinned, but you sinned. And because you sinned, you die. And evil does not let go easily. So, well, so man needs governing for all of these reasons. But that brings us right around to a problem you all are very familiar with today. Government run by man cannot control sin. So it cannot control war. And it cannot control death. And it cannot control the wind or even the spirit of a man. Human government is not the answer. Doesn't that just contradict how you started this whole teaching? Didn't you begin by saying we have to respect the governing authorities and the king? Isn't that what Paul said in Romans 13? And now you're telling us human government is not the answer. Well, I'm not saying that Koheleth is, verse 9. All this I have seen and applied to my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over man to his hurt. To his hurt. That's the deal. You need to respect the human governing authorities, but it's going to hurt you. Because they are not looking out for your best interest, but their own. Human government hurts man. Why? Because man hurts man. But didn't the preacher start out by saying we need to pay attention to the mouth of the king, attend to what the king says? Or or in our case, we make the easy application to the governing authorities. Aren't we supposed to? Yes, we are. But, and listen, but for the sake of your oath to God, not because man rules well. Human government is not the answer, but we're still called to have respect for government because of our oath to the Father, not because of our oath to our president, not because of the oath taken. Those of you in the military, let me just say this to you. You stand for freedom in this world, because of your oath to Jesus Christ. You serve and you... And this goes to every single one of us in our families, in our business lives, everything that we do in life. It is our oath to Jesus under which we live, by which we live. We've got a little problem here in the text, and I've got to clear this up before we do anything further. Verse 2, go back and look at verse 2. New American Standard Bible that that I read from says, I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. The King James Version says, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath to God. The New International Version, some of you have that. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Now, the New Living Translation And the Holman Christian Standard Bible and some others recognize that something's missing. What's missing? The word say. 
If you're looking at it in the Hebrew, the word say is not present. In fact, in your New American Standard Bibles, you can just draw a line through it because it's not there. The word say is not there. And so they translate it this way. New Living Translation. Ecclesiastes 8.2 says, Obey the king since you vowed to God that you would. I'm going to say I say, but the, it's implied that Kohalath is commanding the people to do this, right? The Holman Christian Standard Bible puts it this way. Keep the king's command because of your oath made before God. Okay, well, that's an easy way to translate it. Why don't we just go with that? There's still a problem. Because if you leave out the word say, and track with me, this is critically important. If you leave out the word say, there's also another little word that sometimes is left out, but is there in the text. You see, the Hebrew starts out with this irritating little first person singular personal pronoun, I. The word I. It's just hanging out there all by itself at the front of the sentence. You take the word say out, you still got the I sitting there. Little I. The word in the Hebrew, ayin. So what? Thanks for the English lesson. Well, it's not English. First of all, it's Hebrew. But (laughs) here's the deal. Some have said that the word say down through the years was accidentally dropped. You know, the scribes in writing it, someone missed it one day. And then the next guy who copied the guy before him missed that. And so the say just kind of got dropped out of the scriptural text. I don't accept that. I don't accept it. God's too smart for that. And the Lord has kept his word for us down through time. And I am one, and there are those who disagree, those who say, well, you can't be that literal, Rick, because, you know, over time, someone's got to have made a mistake, not the Holy Spirit. And I believe the word come down to us, if we're looking at it in the Hebrew or we're looking at New Testament Greek, is the word God intends for us to have. So coming back to it, what it really says, and there's only one way to correctly translate this verse. The say is not there. The I is there. Therefore, what it reads is, I keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying Koheleth is not commanding people that he's preaching to. He's saying, I do this. I keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Okay. Well, don't you see? That brings up a whole new problem. Because if Kohaleth is Solomon, which many of us assume that he is, wouldn't that make him the king? Which is a title he's been avoiding since chapter 2, but wouldn't he be the king? How can the king say, I keep the command of the king? He is the king. So how do we square all this and why does it even matter? I think two things are going on in this verse that are important to understand. Solomon, as Kohaleth, is honestly demonstrating the flaws of human government, even his own. He even recognizes in his own government there are flaws and problems. And man hurts man. But I also believe that Kohaleth, as Solomon declares that he serves a higher king because of his oath to that king, God himself. I keep the command of the king because of the oath before God, and God is the king. Listen, because this is absolutely key, I believe, to living under any governing authority, Democrat, Republican, Socialist, capitalist, good, bad, oppressive, free, whatever. Wherever you live in this world, and this applies to Americans as well as Iranians, whatever governing authority you live under, here's the key to living under that authority. My oath is to the king. My oath is to the king. When verse 9 says, man has exercised authority over man to his hurt... How are we as Christians supposed to respond when our government exercises authority to our hurt? I'll tell you how. My oath is to the king. Therefore, if my government hurts me, so be it. So be it. I serve a higher king. If my taxes go up, so be it. If the economy goes down, so be it. If my precious American freedoms take a backseat to regulation... Oh, oh, by the way, have you heard the EPA just came out? The EPA. 
just came out and said, those of you with asthma who buy over-the-counter uh, breathalyzers, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. It's bad for the environment. You're going to have to spend more money and buy prescription only. That's a new regulation that they've come out with. They are regulating our freedoms right out the door. And yet, if my freedom takes a backseat to regulation, or worse, to tyranny itself, if government functions to my own personal hurt, so be it. I can be like Zedekiah and lose all sight. Or I can be like Daniel and serve the king, my king, Jesus. Well, Rick, that kind of sounds passive. No, I'm not talking about passivity. I am talking about faith. Faith. My oath belongs to a higher king. I'll vote. Absolutely. I will express my rights as an American. But when push comes to shove, and in this country, I expect that it will before the end comes. I must serve a higher king. I've taken an oath. When did you take that oath, Rick? Well, when I said, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, I bow to you, Jesus Christ, risen one. You are my Lord and my Savior. And from that moment forward, my oath was to the king. Wherever I be, wherever he places me, however I must live, my oath is to the king. I live for him. Under any oppression. And we can take a lesson from Koheleth as to how, (coughs) excuse me, how to relate to King Jesus. How do we do that? Look at verse 2 again. I keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. First thing you do, you keep his commandments. You keep Jesus' commandments. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Oh, so that's how I prove I love you? No, that's the, that's the response of a person who loves Jesus. You can't love him and not keep his commandments. If you love him, you're naturally going to keep his commandments because you love him so much. He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. In John 15, 10, he says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. Whatever he commands, so be it. So be it, Lord Jesus. If you command me to live in the freedom of America, so be it. Thank you, Jesus. If you command me to live under an oppressive regime like China, I've told you before, those in the underground church in China aren't saying, they're not saying, come fight for our freedom. No. The attitude is the persecution is giving us strength in growing the church. Don't fight that that be taken away. (laughs) Because that's what's bringing people to faith. Because they serve King Jesus. Not the Chinese government. Keep His commandments. Secondly, keep close to the King. Verse 3, I love this. He says, do not be in a hurry to leave Him. Literally, to go out from His presence. Don't be in a hurry to go out from His presence. What, you got something better to do than be with Jesus? We used to... Like count the seconds to get out of Sunday morning. As a kid growing up with my little Snoopy wristwatch. <laughs> Snoopy's hand is like 30 seconds from the one. It's, oh, it's time to go. Oh, he's, the guy's still going. Don't be in a hurry to leave the presence of Christ. Don't be in a hurry to rush out to life. And it's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's just a life thing. You're praying and the phone rings. Don't be, let the phone ring. Don't be in such a hurry to move away from Jesus. Ephesians 2.13 Now in Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So keep close to Him. Keep His commandments. Keep close to the King. And number three, don't cross the King. Don't cross the King. Verse four, since the word of the King is authoritative, who will say to Him, what are you doing? Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven, and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Don't cross the king. Don't counter Jesus. Don't fight against the will that he has for your life. 
Ask Him if it's His will, and then accept it as His will. He said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And you know the prophet Isaiah said, A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on His shoulders. And His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of His government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And there's your perfect government. And that government is coming. So keep the commandments of King Jesus and keep close to him. And don't cross the king. And finally, number four, take comfort in the king. Verse eight. No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind. But he's done it. Jesus has restrained both the wind and the spirit. Jesus has the power over the wind and the power over the spirit. And he spoke the one word hush and it was all still. Doesn't he have that power over your spirit? Have you noted that when the hurricane winds of trouble are blowing in your life and you're just freaking out and then you remember Jesus, don't you hear the hush? And suddenly, as bad as things may seem, when you're looking at Jesus, everything goes still and calm. The wind and the waves cease because he's got the power over the spirit. He's got the power to restrain. Right now, as we said, his Spirit is restraining the hurricane winds of sin and lawlessness in this day. Power over death. (laughs) Check. He's got that one covered. John 10, 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. The Romans didn't kill Jesus, <laughs> and the Jews didn't kill Jesus. He died by his authority. In his time, he was able to say, it's finished. I've done what I came to do. And he laid down his life. And by the way, in the resurrection, he lifted it up again. Amen. What's amazing in the scriptures is it tells us that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, God the Son, all three were involved in the resurrection of Jesus. The power was all three moving at the same time. Remarkable. Power over the wind and the Spirit. Power over death. How about power over sin and evil? Does Jesus have that? I can take comfort in my king because, yes, even over sin and evil, Jesus has the power. Isaiah 53, 12, he poured himself out to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Romans 5, 21, just as sin reigned in death, even so grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How about power over a time of war? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got power over that. Behold, Zechariah says, a day is coming for you when the Lord, for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. And he's talking to the Jewish people. And then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And Revelation 19 opens us up further. Verse 11, I saw heaven open to behold a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness. He judges and wages war. And if that day is but just around the corner, I say, so be it. So be it. Until then, I have sworn an oath before God to keep my king's commandments. To stay close to my king. Not to cross my king, but to take comfort in my king, King Jesus. And when the world begins to blow, gang, remember, he is the great authority under which we walk. And there is no other. And we respect and do our best to follow the laws of this land, but recognizing our higher king, is Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we recognize this this morning. We accept and realize that we sit this morning under your authority. And that we move and function, Lord, in your power and under your commands. And we want to be faithful, Lord, to keep those commands. To do as you tell us to do when you tell us to do it. 
to follow you first and foremost over all other things. And we recognize, Lord Jesus, that you have placed governments in positions in different times throughout the history of the world, from Nebuchadnezzar's government to our current government right now in America. All of these have been placed by your hand for your perfect timing. We don't fully understand your will, Father, but we believe that every procedure of your spirit is being carried out before our very eyes. And so we take great peace in you, Lord. We take all of our comfort in you, Jesus. If you have never sworn allegiance or authority to Jesus before today, I invite you to do it. I invite you to pray after me to the Lord. In your heart, just say, Jesus Christ, risen Lord, I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.